Hi, welcome to Happenings. I'm Helen Moriarty. On this show, Michael Esfiera gives art lessons to the members of the Chensford Art Society and later talks about famous artists with his impressions of them. The artist is a graduate of the Museum School of Fine Arts in Boston. Presently, he is teaching classes on figure drawing at the Whistler House Museum in Lowell, Massachusetts. Fiera's paintings are in numerous private collections throughout the Western world. He has exhibited work at the Guild of Boston Artists, along with other galleries nationally and internationally known. Lately, he has begun taping art lessons and putting them on the internet. One can access these lessons on Google, Michael S. Vieira, YouTube. Come with me to hear Vieira teaching and expounding on art and to see what is happening. I never want any lines pointing towards a corner because then my eye starts looking at that corner. So I never want that happening, which I explained at the beginning. But also what happens too, is if I put any lines going this way, like I don't, want, I don't want the viewer to look at the next painting. I want the viewer to stay in this painting and look at my painting only, not, not, not my competitor. So I always try to find something to bring the painting, the eye back into the painting, you know? You try to keep things, you definitely want to keep things happening inside constantly. Um, and, and good vehicles of doing that is like this path could help you do that. You know, like if your path actually came from here and did a nice little wrap around, you know, then, you, then your eye actually enters through the path and follows the path. No. No, no. Actually, if you put a green mat, if you put a green mat, then all your reds and oranges and yellows will start showing up. Like the bottle. Yeah, I'm just thinking. Behind it, maybe not have the bottle at all, and well, make the tray behind it darker. Darker, definitely the tray behind it darker. Everything yeah. back here should be darker. Because and then maybe the cutting board sell. darker too. This the cutting board, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know if there's a way to get like more chroma. You guys know what I mean by chroma, right? The intensity of a color. So there's the hue, uh, there's chroma, and there's value. The hue is red, yellow, blue, purple. It's what color it is. The chroma is how intense it is, uh, and the value is how light and dark it is. Okay. So this feels like you need more chroma and you need more value in this. Um, now this, this, it has a lot of chroma in it, and you have you have value. You're not having any problems that that this is happening. Just caught it. They're not having the same problems. They're having different problems. Um, so Helen, what I was thinking with yours, you have this line, and it's sort of like a stutter, like it's echoing the frame already. You know, you have these kind of, mm -hmm. everything is very, everything is talking to the frame, which is weird, because you don't want the frame <laughs> in the conversation at all. <laughs> um, and it feels like, you know, like, you, is, this, is this from imagination? Doing this on your head? Yeah, well, yeah, you know, whatever you see, like. Uh, okay. Yeah. See, because I can sort of tell, like, you're starting to do it. You're sort of, like, you're hinting at it. Like, you did this right here, right? Which is actually awesome and what you should be doing, but it should be, you want more. I want more of that. Yeah, I needed to give it a little more punch, you know. I think I have to work on it again. What I think I would do is I would bring the darks up higher. Because your darks are lined up. See yeah. That? I can almost snap a line right across. Yeah. So I think I would have a dark up here higher, yeah. have that lower, have a dark up here higher. You know, so that way at least to have different elevations. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and of course make this. Make that beautiful. Just have all the chrome you want right there. How about the blue? Is that dark enough or light enough? Or blue is definitely dark enough. I would is. not go any darker without blue. Yeah. Um, but that's not light enough. I mean, when I say light, it, it doesn't feel like it's, it's producing its own light, which, which it should, you should kind of trick your eye into thinking that there's actually a sun setting there. So definitely make that pure and more of that color. This is uh, acrylic? Yes, yes. One of my friends, as a landscape painter, uses uh, flesh tint, which is kind of an interesting color because 
you look, you squeeze that color out, like paint. Ew. I've never seen anybody's skin like that. But he's like, oh, I put it in sunsets all the time. He's like, I'll, I'll paint it on the bottom of a cloud. I'll just use pure flesh tint right out of the tube. Wow. Uh, so it's a nice color. If you, ever, if you guys know that color flesh tint, you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, see here, you've got, so you have all your darks happening in one spot. And it just doesn't feel, it's not, I don't know, it's just not comfortable. It almost feels like you can do one, two, and then something dark down here. See how we have a big diagonal? Do you know what I mean? I don't know, it just feels like, it feels like, um, It doesn't feel like it's moving, but it's trying to make it feel like it's moving. Even though it's still life and it's still, you still want it to feel sort of alive, you know? Cork. Cork. Yeah, I mean, yeah, cork. You can do just, just something else, another element down there. And I think that'll give you grapes. Grapes, grapes yeah. Um, it's weird because you have, you have some squares showing up. You know, you've got some 90 degree angles. So maybe a cork would probably be a better idea than grapes. But definitely rotate things. Keep things upside down when you're working on stuff. I know, it's like the worst. <laughs> That's the worst thing ever. I've done that, I've done that where I, I, I take a mirror and I would look at it, and I'm like, oh, I like it better backwards. <laughs> um, I don't know, you guys have any other questions? I have Michael, I have a question. Sure. Okay. Um, you just referred to example, if you were doing the border with the wine glass, you just started to do the painting itself, would you just concentrate on just the one bottle first? Would you, you would outline what you want? How do you actually start your painting? Um, when I start, when I paint, um, and just a little quote here, um, drawing is so important that it comes last. Um, if you think of like, uh, for instance, let's, let's say, okay, you got a royal feast, right? Okay, so the first people that come to the room for the royal feast, are the cooks and everybody's setting up tables and stuff like that, all the grunt work. You know, they're decorating everything. And, and then the cooks come in and they start bringing all the food in. And then the, um, you know, the upperclassmen, all the people start coming in. And then the dukes and duchesses, they all start coming in. And the very last person to show up is the king and queen. They're so important that they come last. And it's the same with, with, uh, with painting. So, so when, I, when I paint this, what I would have done is I would have, I almost wish I had a paintbrush right now. I would, I would first I'd paint blobs. I would find, I would find my lettuce blob and I would put it down, and I'd find my dark blob right there, put that down, and I'd find my mid-tone blob, put that down, and then once I got the values looking correct, because it's all black and white, so once I got all the values looking correct to each other, and then I start finding edges that are that are that are uh, easy to read, you know, a high reader. So that's a high reader. So I would make that edge. I would have that contrast. I would make it sing. I'd have the effect that I want it to happen. And like edges will be lost. I will just, the lost edges, I'll just let it all kind of merge into each other. And I won't think of it until later, you know. Uh, and maybe at the end I won't even need it. I won't even need to bring that edge out. But it's all blobs. Usually what I do first is all blobs. And then I start pushing things together. Um, and this is small enough that you can probably cover this whole canvas like in about two hours. With paint? Yeah, with paint. Um, <laughs> it wouldn't be accurate, but it's covered. You know, like, like I'm not worried. Your first wave is, you're not worried about accuracy, not quite yet. Um, okay, so when you're drawing, the first thing you do when you draw is you want to put it in the right place. So you want it, you want it kind of in the right place in relation to everything else. And then you want to make it the right size in relation to everything else. And then you start worrying about the right shape. And that's what I mean by drawing. The right shape is drawing, and it comes last. Um, <laughs> I, I get confusing every once in a while, so if you guys want me to clear anything up, um, I'll definitely repeat it again differently, hopefully. Um, so right place, oh, right size, the right place, and then the right shape. Uh, if you're painting, it becomes, it becomes the right value, and then the right um, hue, and then the correct chroma, and then it's the incorrect location, and then the correct size, and then it's the shape that comes last. Hmm. Um, 
I'm sure you've guys seen um, um, uh, other demonstrations where people are like direct painters and it's all blurs and then they start finding edges and they start making those edges come sharp, trying to get the light effect on those edges. Because your eye does play across, you know, little surfaces. Um, sorry. I keep losing my, uh, my train of thought there. Um, it must be different though if you're working with watercolor versus, yes. oh, yeah. versus oil, oil or acrylic because you have to think about your layering in a completely different mm -hmm. way depending on it's what true. your medium is. It's true. Um, the one kind of common denominator between the three is uh, you should always put your lightest colors down first and then and kind of finish things off with your darkest colors. With water except for pastels. <laughs> yeah, that's true, except for pastels. <laughs> but I didn't say pastels. Okay, saying. okay. <laughs> no, no, pastels is a whole different creature. I know, so. like that's that's left side, right side. <laughs> almost. almost, yeah. Mm -hmm. But no, you, you definitely want to do, you want to draw with your darks. So you, you want to kind of lay things in with the light colors and then push your edges in with your darks. So draw with your darks always. And when you're painting things in, to paint the lights a little larger and then, and then start pushing in with your darks. Um, with watercolors, though, that's such a that's such a, that's the most unforgiving of the mediums. Oil is the most forgiving of all the mediums because oil, if you make a mistake, you can just wipe it away. You know, acrylic painting is kind of in the middle. You can sort of scrape it off. You can cover over it. But with watercolor, if you make a mistake, you can put like a tree or something in front of it or something and just hide it. Uh, watercolor becomes really tricky. Um, and definitely hats off to you guys, the ones that the watercolor painters. So far, it's all about the green. You know? But it feels like it needs more. It needs something else. And, and, and you know, it's, it's like, I don't know, I see this light blue and I almost want the light blue in there. Yeah, you know, it's. I yeah, love the action in it that yeah, way. Yeah, the movement happens. I like it. Then. That's the other thing too. Is like by doing that, you get you see this line. Mm -hmm. Well, that changes a lot. It's, yeah, it does. It really does. It's earth, and sometimes it's horizontal. When it's and when you, you do this, you can feel that going down. Yeah. yeah. Abstract abstracts are fun because you can just keep. It. Yeah. See, this doesn't work. It's weird because you can you can tell when something does not work. Did you say she needed some red in there or something? Red, see, like red feels like the obvious answer, but I think you could be clever. I think you could be a little bit more clever. Because this is red enough. I just feel there should be a blue in there. Like, there's blues in here, and I just feel like there should be more blues. I don't know if you can see the, I don't know if you can see these little tiny blues. Yeah. Just feels like, you just, if you put more of those little blues in there, I think, I, th I think you'll have enough because your green, your green becomes your yellow, and your brown is your red already. So once you have a blue, and then also a value too, you need a little dark in here. Is this the? It's like that. <laughs> I love how you you, you washed up, you, you you push back the darks. Any other questions, guys? Yeah. Oh. A composition question mm -hmm. um, about horizon lines. Yep. Now, the, the rule mm -hmm. is that you don't divide. Oh, yeah, in thirds. Because yeah. you don't, well, I'm thinking like for a landscape, uh -huh. for a horizon line, that, that you don't divide. Perfectly in half. half, no, no. You definitely right. want it to be just slightly off. It's interesting with composition, there's, a, we call it the unmeasurable point. There's, it's not a third, you know, it's not a quarter, it's not half, it's this weird kind of in between a third and a quarter, it's that unmeasurable point. Um, and you sort of, you can sort of feel it, you know. Like this is nice because this isn't, like that's not quite a fourth, you know, because there's a little half left. So it's like, it's like, it's like a, it's like a fourth and a half, you know what I mean? Um, but don't you ever see, I mean, I've captured a lot of things in photo, mm -hmm. and without realizing it, I've kind of you done divided it. Up. And I've divided it, yeah. but it still looks good to me. Yeah, it's weird. I, you know, I'll play I'll play games with like twos all the time. Like I'm talking about twos, 
I'll, I'll play that game, you know what I mean? Like, uh, the painting that I, I, I guess you guys used for my little uh, thing, um, there's two wine glasses, there's two wine bottles. So there's twos, but I tried, I tried putting one wine glass with a wine bottle, so it became one weird object, you know? Um, you know, I tried, and, and then, so it became like a, a wine bottle, wine glass, the flowers, uh, a wine glass, and some fruit. So it became threes, even though there was two wine glasses, two wine bottles. There was a lot of fruit, though. <laughs> and there was only one set of flowers. Um, but uh, was, there was another question, though, I, Carmen. Hi, Michael. Um, I was just wondering if you could let us, throughout your life, yeah. I was wondering if you could let us know which artists you most admire and what do you like about their work in particular? That's a good question. Uh, and a very loaded question, too, because there's a lot of stuff. Um, um, well, first of all, I like, like I was saying earlier when we first got here, that, that I think it's great that you guys are painting, you guys are actually doing things instead of talking about art. So I have a lot of respect for like Chuck Close, for instance. Like Chuck Close was a hyper-realist painter. And then it wasn't a stroke, but something happened where he lost the use of his arms. He kept on painting. And I have so much respect for that. And I just love the perseverance. And it was actually just recently at the Whistler House, there was an artist who lost his sight. Uh, he was doing realistic paintings and he lost his sight, so now he does large abstract pieces. And um, I just have a lot of respect for that. Like because you're, you keep going because there's something about it that you need to continue going. But artists, I like um, actually a book. Some books I'd like to recommend. Um, there's uh, Harold Speed. That's the uh, Science of Practicing Drawing. It's a good book. It's he uh, it kind of covers a lot of things. Um, composition uh, books on composition. I feel that you should buy like a hundred of them and read them all. And, and, and the things you keep hearing over and over and over are the things you should actually pay attention to. Um, <laughs> that's what composition, sorry. So you buy 100 books. Um, but actual artists, artists I enjoy right now, I like uh, William McGregor Paxton, Boston painter. I enjoy his work. Um, I like uh, Jerome, um, Jean-Paul Jerome. Uh, he's a 19th century French painter. Um, what else do I like here? Could I mention some artists and sure. then you could just yeah. say what you think of them? Well, a lot of times if you ask people who they like the most, one of the first they mention is Vincent Van Gogh. Yeah. What do you think of his work? Um, hit or miss. Uh, I think his earlier work, um, he was trying to draw. In his earlier work, he was trying to become something that he wasn't. He was trying to emulate all the other French painters. And then when he became true to himself, and that's when his work took off. Um, you know, like a, a good example, I think his good transition was the postman. The portrait of the postman is kind of, I think, where he kind of separated from trying to impress other people and, and painting for yourself. And that's ultimately what we should be doing, we should be painting for yourself. It's basically like, you know, screw what people think. <coughs> screw what I say. It doesn't matter. Do it for yourself. It's more important than you doing it for yourself. And. Um, you know, it's it's hit or miss a lot of times. You know? Well, why don't we just quickly just quick go, go a few go. of them? How about Vermeer? Uh, since you're a realist painter, yeah. you must right. love Vermeer, right? Vermeer is awesome. Breaks my heart that there's a few uh, stolen pieces from the gardener. Yeah. Um, uh, Vermeer is an interesting one to watch with composition too. He's got nice, like he Vermeer because I mentioned it earlier with a basketball-sized focal point. If you look at Vermeer, you'll you'll see like there's one. Can't, Vermeer is one painted, I think it's like 38 paintings, so it's not hard to find the one I'm going to reference. But uh, it's, it's this woman, um, she's writing a letter, or she's sitting at a table and the, the maid is handing her a letter. Yes. Yes. So your eye, yellow so, yes, yeah. so Vermeer controlled your eye through the whole entire painting, you know, and that's something fun to watch with Vermeer. And, and you should look at art in person all the time. If you can go to the museum, definitely do it and look at it in person, um, because reproductions do no justice. Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. But Vermeer is nice. It's a fun one yeah. to like. I think he's a master of color too. But yeah. that there's some similarities in the way Vermeer had a wonderful composition, simplified things, to Edward Hopper, a more contemporary <laughs> working painter. What do you think of Edward Hopper's work? Hopper is uh, really fun with complementary colors. Hopper is definitely a colorist. He had a, you know, you'll, if you look at his works, red and green, always next to each other. You know, he's got beautiful like oranges and blues next to each other. 
Hopper's fun. Definitely go through his work and start looking at his things. Um, he's got a lot more chroma, like for my personal taste, because it's louder, I like more subdued and more, more calming pieces. Yeah. So I like more neutral colors, yeah. and his colors are, are, are very chromatic. Yeah. Uh, so I yeah. kind of will balance. Yeah. And just quickly, I don't want to take up too much time, but uh, John Singh the Sergeant, everybody Sergeant. seems to love him yeah. in this area, and what a wonderful painter and, and a master of color. Yeah. Uh, what do you think of one, his one work? Of, one of Boston's gold boys. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Sergeant, Sergeant's interesting. Sergeant is a genius. And the thing about Sergeant, I've read uh, a couple essays, uh, unpublished essays by um, by Ives Gamble, he wrote on Sargent. Um, Sargent is a genius, and he will start a painting, and if it's, a, if it's bad, he does not know how to pull himself out of that mess. And he will he'll finish, and the painting won't be successful. Um, but then every once in a while, sometimes it becomes pure genius, and, and he'll finish it like within a blink of an eye. Um, and it's weird because Sargent can't explain why. You know, like Sargent really couldn't teach. Um, just because he knew it intuitively, which is interesting with Sargent. Um, and personally, I love Sargent. Yeah. And, you know, it's, and he, seems, he seems to be a master in both oil and watercolor. And watercolor Did you notice, I mean, yeah. the way he in Venice, those paint yeah. the watercolors in Venice are amazing. Interesting, way, interesting thing about uh, composition in Sargent and Venice watercolors is uh, people have gone on Sargent you know, field trips and painted his scenes, and they'll, they'll sit there, they'll set up their cameras and be like, he moved that church 10 miles over. You know? <laughs> the church is there, but it should be in his painting, it's there. And it's all purely because of composition, you know? So that's the other thing, is don't be a slave to nature. Because uh, nature is random, and it needs to be filtered through the artist to make it beautiful. Nature's beautiful anyway, but, but being filtered through an artist, uh, it, you, you start bringing up the, the majesty, the magic, and things like that. Yeah. Uh, any other artists? Go ahead, throw another artist yeah. How about, thank speaking you. of colorists, how about Wolf Khan? I'm not familiar with his work, I don't think. Wolf Khan? Albert Hibbert? Hibbert. 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 Oh, Hibbert? Uh, he's a landscape painter, right? Yeah, oh, his stuff is great. Yeah. Kind uh, of, right here. Hibbert. Yeah. Lots of purples in his work. Um, There's, a, there's, a, some, there's not many books on Hibbert, but there's really, the ones that are out there are really, really, really nice. Um, Hibbert's, the thing about white, which is crazy, white will reflect out every color. So you'll get pinks in the whites, you'll get blues from the whites, or purples in the whites, yellows. So you can see how, like, this is, you're actually seeing the whites, you know, the pink in there, the blue in there. And Hibbert does that a lot. He plays that game really well, too. Um, anyone else? Stapleton Kearns. Stapleton Kearns. Uh, I, just, I just mentioned Stapleton uh, to check out his blog. Uh, Stapleton's awesome. Yes, he has such a good time. I've painted with him a couple times. Um, wow. We've gone out uh, up in, um, he lives in, um, he, uh, where does he live? Derry. He lives in Derry. And we've, we've gone out and painted barns. Every once in a while, I have Stapleton's a good time. He's such a good guy. And definitely worth reading his blogs. Um, Sargent has done something interesting. I was just going to mention with Sargent. Um, Sargent will use like sometimes he'll use like two different blues for, for things. You know, he'll use two different reds for things. Like he'll use a certain blue in the highlight, and then he'll use a different blue in the shadow. And it has this weird kind of because it's a different pigment. It has a weird kind of effect that that's almost unexpected. Um, um, what else? All right. So anybody else? Come on. Throw some more out of it. <laughs> Winslow. Oh yeah, Homer. Uh, Winslow Homer. Um, the, Sterling Clark Museum, the Sterling Clark Museum out in Western Mass. I highly recommend it to go out there. They've got probably one of the largest collection of Homers um, in the country. Um, Homer, I, I really like his Adirondack stuff, the mountains. Uh, I don't know what it is uh, with his work. It's like, I, I don't know, you know, because Homer's known well for his landscapes, uh, his seascapes, sorry. When you start seeing landscapes, you're like, it becomes unexpected. You're like, ooh, wow. And Homer's actually produced uh, quite a bit of tropical paintings, too, which is not very well known, but you can find them. You can find them. He's painted a few things in Florida. Um, all right, anyone else? <laughs> I really, and I can't think of the artist's name, if you can help me. Um, Brescian, and he does sort of abstract, but not, he's old school. Russian. Kandinsky? No. Uh -huh. oh, Kandinsky's fun too. That's another good guy for watching composition. 
see how his eye, keeping your eye, you know, flowing within the painting, convinced is a good one to look at. There's also a Jewish artist too. Um, Shigal? No, no, no. Shigal, Shigal. Shigal. Oh, is that who you're talking about? Shigal is another fun one with uh, with color. Composition, mm, he does kind of like weird things. He does weird. I, I, love, yeah. his, I love his stuff though. Like, like uh, you know, from what I can think of, like, he'll do composition, he'll have this big, weird, like, yeah. face on the corner of the painting. It just feels, I don't know, there's something weird about it, you know? Yeah. Definitely. But sometimes, like, tension in a painting is good though, you know? Like, it keeps you there, you know, it keeps you looking at it. Um, but, Clint? Sure. Okay. But Andrew Wyatt, I'm sure you Why? Um, um, yes, yes. yes. Um, he seems to have very subdued yeah, colors. Yeah. And then I, I always notice he has like one focal point, mm -hmm. like a complementary yeah. color for okay. like center of interest. Very there. muted earth tones. Now, if, uh, out of the Wyatt family, I love his father, N.C. Wyatt. Mm -hmm. um, Brighter colors. That's yeah. definitely, he's a great colorist. Yeah. Um, He's also, because he's an illustrator, he needs to be narrative with his work. Um, but he still doesn't lose the beauty. You know, he still doesn't lose, like, it's a fun thing to look at his compositions. Um, another artist I really like, which actually might be surprising, is, um, is uh, Norman Rockwell, um, as an illustrator. Uh, if you look at look, Norman Rockwell's work, uh, watch his, watch, look at the contours of his figures. Like, there's one I can think of, there's a painting of, um, it's like Huckleberry Finn, or it's Tom Sawyer. The school teacher's like beating him with like a, a switch. So if you look at, at, at his uh, school teacher, you know, there's so much like, he's got all these little ins and outs. You know, he, he's very aware of his, of his, uh, oh, I'm messing this up, but, <laughs> And, you know, he's very aware of his contour. He's got the most interesting things happening, you know, and he has like a little leg. You know, like, <laughs> that's just crazy. Man. Disregard that. <laughs> but, yeah. Um, um, I like my too. Like, they're very, yeah. they seem to have a lot of heart or meaning in his. That's true, yeah. You know, with people in them, they all have emotion. It's, it's, yeah, it's see, yeah, Norman Rockwell gets kind of written off because he's an illustrator and because his paintings are very quaint and stuff. But he was trained. Uh, he was trained really well. He actually wrote a book on composition, um, and it's it, good luck finding it because <laughs> I, I just found a big Xerox thing of it and had like him and Pyle uh, and NC uh kind of talk you know talk about composition in this book. Um, and all those guys were classically trained too, which is great. There was another painter who he did like Santa Claus. Paintings for 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 Coca Cola a oh, long yeah. time ago. Yeah, and and uh, and he's like an impressionist. You can see just those beautiful colors. You know, Santa's beard has like green green in it. It's really interesting how his choices of colors. Um, I don't remember his name though. Unfortunately, it's not James Montgomery Flynn, is it? He did Uncle Sam. Yeah, maybe, maybe. I'm not sure. Um, it's a similar style. Yeah. Um, so, any other questions or anything like that? <laughs> so, thank you so much for bringing your work in. Thank you. Yeah, good luck and happy campaign. Thank you so much, Michael Esfiera, for teaching us how to improve our paintings and giving us your impressions of some of the famous artists. It has been very enlightening.